um, we're continuing with the uh, theme of endocarditis, um, but now uh, in the adult congenital heart disease population. This is a talk given by uh, Dr. Rafael Alonso. Uh, Dr. <coughs> uh, Alonso is the current director of the adult congenital heart disease program at Toronto General Hospital. He completed his specialist cardiology training in uh, Badajoz and Madrid, Spain, um, and his um, ACHD fellowship at the Royal Brompton Hospital in London, UK, uh, between 2009 and 2011. Uh, in 2011, he was appointed as the staff cardiologist in uh, Badajoz, Spain, where he was the um, director of the pulmonary hypertension unit. In 2012, he moved to the uh, Royal Bromson Hospital in London, um, where he was a consultant cardiologist in um, adult congenital heart disease and pulmonary hypertension. He was the director of the ACHD inpatient services and established the ACHD heart failure unit there. He then came across to Toronto in uh, 2018, where he joined the ACHD unit and where he's also the fellowship director. Um, so Dr. Alonso, um, please uh, take it away. Um, endocarditis in the adult congenital heart disease population. Thank you very much and um, good morning or good afternoon already everyone. And thank you for the organizers for inviting me. <clears throat> no, thank you for uh, for giving me a talk after Dr. Sam, which is uh, did a, a fantastic and excellent talk, and it's going to be very challenging to to say something uh, uh, new or, or better than she has done. But we're going to try to focus this talk on endocarditis just in the ACD population. I have no conflict uh, uh, to declare, and I always like to start the, the ACD talks saying that if anything we have done very well in medicine in the last years is to improve survival in patients with uh, congenital heart disease. Marcin said that this morning that uh, the, the adult population is growing and, and, and it's true because now if you are born with a congenital heart disease, even if you have a complex congenital heart disease, almost 95% of patients will make it to adulthood. So this has uh, led to a, a, a significant increase in numbers of adult patients with chronic heart disease in the world to the point that in in developed in, in developed countries and the, in the in the first world the number of adults with chronic heart disease already have uh, surpassed the number of pediatric patients with chronic heart disease. But of course, survival with chronic heart disease has a price to pay and. Uh, uh, the first thing that comes to us is many of these patients are left with, are palliated and left with residual lesions that might or might not need surgery in life um, during uh, their, their lifespan. But one of the main complications and problems that we, we deal in patients with mental heart disease is, uh, is definitely endocarditis. Endocarditis is very common, so the incidence is higher than in patients with acquired heart disease. Actually, increases over time. So uh, uh, the pediatricians, they, they don't see much endocarditis, whereas in, in, in the adult population, we see more and more as the patients get older. So, well, the risk of endocarditis on, on the left-sided lesions is, uh, is, is important. And there are some papers that suggesting that uh, the most common location for uh, uh, endocarditis in going heart disease is actually the LVOT. Their assessment is not different than the, than the assessment in acquired heart disease. And Dr. San has already given an excellent lecture that has take, uh, taken us through how to assess all uh, the valves, uh, in, but mainly focus on the left side valves. So what makes really endocarditis in congenital heart disease difference? Well, we have a higher in this, in this um, uh, incidence of endocarditis on the right side of the heart. This is uh, a paper that uh, is being published recently uh, is uh, from Denmark. They look at uh, a cohort of congenital heart disease patients from born in 1977, and uh, they look at the, their lifespan until 2018, and uh, they they um, uh, they confirm or they show that actually the patients that can have or have a higher risk of endocarditis are not surprisingly patients with tetraiofalot or any other patients that have an intravascular malformation, call it a VSD or transposition or truncus or AV cell defects, and uh, a less, less common 
uh, patients with uh, with um, uh, with uh, heart valves or, or with minor uh, uh, defects. What are these risk factors that uh, that make these patients a higher risk of endocarditis? Well, being a male, having a cyanotic coronary heart disease, we know that that's a problem and increases the risk of of uh, endocarditis in all our patients, having a prosthesis, which is very common in our patients because any kind of repair but is gonna, is gonna be done with, with some prosthetic material. Having actually a kidney dysfunction, or of course having a device in the heart makes them a higher risk of having endocarditis. So we said that one of the in the patients with a, a higher risk of endocarditis is patients with tetraiofalot, and that's not a surprise because actually being the most common cyanotic coronary heart disease at birth is one of the populations that we deal more often in a congenital heart disease program. Here in Toronto, we have around uh, uh, 15 or 1,600 patients with tetraiofalot, and when you prepare a tetraiofalot, what you do is you just to put your, the, the surgeons put a, a patch in the VSD and they release the outflow tract. And depending on how severe the obstruction is, they might just uh, release the, some muscle in the in the infundibulum. But most of these patients will have a, a transannular patch and many of them, mainly those with tricuspid uh, pulmonary atresia, will have a, a conduit. And these are source of infection of for, for in, if these patients have endocarditis. So in, when you have a patient with uh, with the uh, uh, fallow, the most common area or, 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 or area of infection is is the pulmonary valve, which is is uh, is common sense because it's where the surgery is being done. So it's important to assess your pulmonary valve in all these patients, and as you know. The pulmonary valve is normally seen in the in your midst of a GL view. Just make sure that you you can see the 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 leaflets properly, and you can see here on the left side a patient with a, a pulmonary valve full of uh, of um, independently mobile mass, suggesting that uh, uh, um, vegetation. And make sure also that you assess the the function of the valve, and you put your color, and you can see here how this aliasing. And as as Doctor San said, uh, a valve, infected valve, might not have regurgitation, but um, uh, and that's only mean that the valve is not destro uh, de um, destroyed, but definitely can have stenosis, and it's very common in our patients to present with stenosis. We said that the other thing that uh, the the patients with the diaphalot also have had a VSD patch, and every time that you see a patient with fallot that had an infected pulmonary valve, as Doctor San said. The, uh, the adjacent or the, the areas close to the infection might get infected. The patch is in very close relationship with the pulmonary valve, and then you have to look at your patch in your, in your metasophageal view. But a view that I really like to look at the VSD patch is the, is the long axis view when you have your uh, LVOT and you see here, here clearly the patch. And when you look at the patch, you have to look for two things. One is can be some small masses attached to the patch that sometimes is difficult and tricky to say if whether or not there are small vegetations, but they, they, it's important to rule out uh, the hissings of the patch because it's not uncommon that patients with uh, a, an endocarditis, even many years after the fallow repair, if the fact if, if the patch gets infected, this can, the, can become the hiss and have a residual VSD. But actually, but the problem is not in every single patient, the bar, uh, and all of you do uh, uh, TAE perioperatively, and you see how challenging sometimes is to look at the pulmonary valve and have a clear picture of the pulmonary valve uh, leaflets or, or the cusps of the pulmonary valve. And in those patients where you are not sure, you don't see the leaflets properly, the image is not clear, a view that I really, I really like is is the is the high uh, the high esophageal view where you can see the the pulmonary trunk you can see the bifurcation of the pulmonary arteries and you can see clearly the uh, the valve and in this case you see the uh, mobile mass in the pulmonary valve which is uh, clearly a diagnosis of a of a endocarditis 
Three days, Dr. Sun said, is uh, is not really helpful when the ma uh, because you can miss a small a small masses. But uh, in cases with big vegetations, you can just see here. This is a 3D taking from the picture on the left, and you can see the mobile mass they are coming into the pulmonary trunk. This view actually is 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 very important in in a patients with. Uh, bioprosthetic valve in that area because it's the view that actually allows us the best uh, uh, is the best view that allows us to align the jet and really see whether or not that valve is a stenotic. Here you can see it's, it's a patient that uh, have a bioprosthetic, uh, he underwent a cephalo repair and after bioprosthetic valve replacement and he came with a uh, bacteremia and when we did the transthoracic, what we saw is there's an obstruction of the afro tract, but we did not see any vegetations. And when we did the the T, looking at the valve from the high uh, esophageal view, you can see there that the valve is very thickened and uh, has some masses attached. And uh, when you put the color, is this valve has no significant regurgitation, just confirming that the statement that uh, uh, Dr. Sam mentioned that uh, lack of regurgitation that doesn't mean that you don't have endocarditis. But the more interesting part is you can see how accelerated the flow is in there. And when we put the Doppler, as I said, this is the best view you have to really align the Doppler and see your your narrowing or your stenosis. The grading across this valve is 112 millimeters of mercury, making that RV a uh, hard to work and. Uh, and this is something that we might miss if we don't use this uh, this view when assessing these uh, pulmonary valves. So these are if 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 the if the this view is important in patients with uh, with uh, conduits, it's even more important in patients that have by a um, percutaneous valve. And I want to bring this case because this is one is one case that I think all of us. Learn a lot when when this uh, this patient was admitted. This is, is one of my patients. He is 34 years old, has a, a Down syndrome. He had a fallout repair in in childhood, and after after that, he had a melody valve implanted two years before this admission. And he presented in hospital with a two weeks history of uh, a fever, malaise night sweats and abdominal pain. This was in his local hospital. Uh, he was admitted and his blood cultures uh, became positive for Staphylococcus lugudensis. He underwent an abdominal ultrasound in the local hospital, which showed thickening of the gallbladder. And uh, he was diagnosed at that point with cholecystitis. And uh, they, thought, they thought that was the, the source of the infection. But he was referred to as because of uh, his congenital heart disease and his previous valve implantation to rule out endocarditis. We did the transthoracic echo, which was completely normal, and uh, with a normal function of his melody valve and no other significant findings. Again, because of the clinical history and the history of bacteremia, we went on and did a, a TEE. And uh, as you can see, as soon as you have a... Um, melody valve or any any percutaneous valve that as you know they have a large stent you have a lot of artifact in the in the TE and sometimes it's challenging to see the the, the valves well so this is the mid-esophageal view and all you can see here is some thickening in the in the cast for a valve that is being is only two years old that is not normal but due to the poor quality or or, or there are a lot of shadowing that we have there we couldn't see any vegetations. So when this happens, sometimes what helps is to go to your transgastric view. And, and in the transgastric view, you can. we had the same problem. The stent came into play and we couldn't really see much of the leaflets, but the valve worked, bet worked very well. And uh, we went on and looked for a, I'm sorry for the videos because they were working okay. I'm gonna stop this one to see if the other one wants to play properly. It doesn't, okay. Really sorry. So, so what I wanted to show here went on and find, try to find another views, and this is a short axis view of the, of the, uh, of the melody valve, and you can see there the thickening of of, of the cast there, but 
in this study, we couldn't see any vegetation, then this was giving us a, 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 a clear study, no endocarditis. The patient was treated with uh, for his cholecystitis and sent home. Five days later, just uh, uh, less than a week, he comes back with exactly the same symptoms. Patient had fever, again malaise, again, again night sweats and abdominal pain. But this time the blood cultures are negative, which is not a surprise having been treated with antibiotics already beforehand. Again, we did the transthoracic, which showed, no surprisingly, exactly the same done before. The melody valve was working absolutely fine. There were no vegetations visualized. And then, and then we went on and did again another T. This is a week after the previous T. We used the same, we, we started with the same views than before. And again, the, the, the mid esophageal view, a lot of artifact in there, a lot of shadow in there, sorry, for, for, from the, the stent of the valve. Again, thickening of the cast, but not much of uh, anything in there. Again, transgastric view. We can see the valve beta here. Don't see the cast clear, but we don't see anything that suggests a vegetation. But this time around, we went to the high uh, esophageal view, which is, I think, a view that you always have to do in any patients with a percutaneous pulmonary valve. And I show you now why. And the first thing we see is that is this these caspers are really thickened for a valve that is just two years old. It's a little bit of acceleration of flow, but the valve is not stenotic, opens well. There is no regurgitation as, uh, as uh, happened with the previous patient. But when we move a little bit higher and go to the back of the stand, we see this, this mobile if a thread like mass attached there, which actually is, is a vegetation. And it's because these patients with, with uh, bioprosthetic pulmonary uh, percutaneous valves, they actually they do not normally form the vegetations in the lipless or in the cusps, they form the vegetations either in the back of the stent, as this as as is this is the case, or as you can see there, or within the stent itself. And if you do not uh, uh, do this view, then you're gonna miss the diagnosis of a vegetation. This is something that happens very often, or more more than the, than the, in many centers that they don't have experience with assessing these patients. But if a patient with a by, with a percutaneous valve has a bacteremia, most of them will get an infection, but the vegetations rarely or almost never are in the in the cast, but always, or almost always will be in the stent and most often than not at the back of the stent. So this view become key in order to diagnose these patients. Again, we said that when you have uh, any kind of pulmonary valve, and this is the patient we saw before with uh, a, a conduit or valve stenosis, the important thing is to assess the stenosis. And is that because if you have an stenotic valve, you can have a right ventricular dysfunction, which might actually lead to a, a, a speed the, or, or, or make the, surgical, the, the, the decision of operating the patients earlier. So every time that you see a significant stenosis in a conduit, primary valve, or any RVOT obstruction, important on you in your T to demonstrate and to show the RV function of the patient. And sometimes the transthoracic, or, uh, uh, or most of the time we can see this in transthoracic, but if you have the probe there, it's always a, a a good uh, or, or recommended to show your your RV function at the time of your of your study, and then you can use it. Uh, show it either. Uh, uh, I like to show the RV function in every single view, and as you can see on the left here is the four chamber view. This is this patient with a gradient of a hundred. With he was uh, um, admitted in in ICU in the CCU and have a severely impaired systolic function, as you can see in the four chamber view on the mid esophageal view on the on the left and the transgastric view on the right. So important to assess your right ventricular systolic function every time that you have a uh, um, conduit pulmonary valve RVOT stenosis.
Another lesion that we might find sometimes in congenital heart disease is patients with perimembranous ventricular septal defect. These are patients that had a, um, a VSD and uh, in most of these cases had been closed by, by tricuspid tissue. As you can see on the left side, this is a, a, the VSD is that hole in, in there from here to here. And you can see all this redundant tissue here, which is tricuspid tissue closing that VSD. Some of these patients, the VSD is closed completely, but in some of them, there is some residual shunt and they are prone to have endocarditis. When we assess perimembranous VSD, sometimes it becomes tricky because of the amount of extra tissue the patients have there, but it's important to assess the VSD in every single view. Again, the, the two views that, that uh, we use more often is uh, are the long axis view as we mentioned for assessing the patch. You can see clearly there your VSD and, and your extra tissue. And normally the vegetations on the VSD are on the right side of the VSD, so on the right ventricle because of the direction of the jet. The short axis view also gives you a very good uh, a, a, a image to see both the VSD and the relationship with the tricuspid valve. Uh, you can see how the tricuspid valve tissue is closing that VSD. And normally if they have a vegetation, they're gonna, have, they're gonna show the vegetation no, in the in the right side uh, of the of the VSD normally in the RV, but as doctor uh, as doctor San mentioned, when you have a, a, a infection, you have to look at the adjacent or the or the close areas where the sh the jet is going uh, uh, towards. And every time you have a VSD uh, uh, with an endocarditis, you have to look at your pulmonary valve. This is a patient with uh, infection in the in the uh, VSD which. The, you barely see the the um, uh, the vegetations in the in the VSD. This, the but you can see how the pulmonary valve is uh, is infected. You have just in that thick pulmonary valve with uh, with mobile masses, and this one is totally destroyed actually. And you can see that it's a free flow in the pulmonary artery. So when you have a VSD is important to assess for uh, for the pulmonary valve because commonly uh, is also infected. I want to I, I, I just want to finish with with a, a case that reminds us that uh, sometimes we find infections in places that we are not used to find them at the end. The importance of being very systematic when you do your TEs in order not to miss anything. So this is a, another patient of mine uh, that um, is 23 years old. His pathology is a, is a bicuspid aortic valve with a coactation repair, but the repair was just an stenting when he was a, a teenager. And uh, he presented the hospital with a four weeks history of fever, malaise, anorexia, and weight loss. That's the first thing we thought, okay, well, you have endocarditis. But the, the, but the GP had given had already prescribed him uh, some amoxicillin for a week because of, uh, of, of the fever. And uh, when he was admitted to us, because the symptoms didn't go away, he actually had negative blood cultures. When we did the TE, he had a thickening of the aortic valve, but actually no different than had been before during, in his previous study. This was it's a, a quite uh, dysplastic bicuspid valve, but there, was no there were no vegetations in that valve and there were no signs of recoarctation. Again, because of, uh, as, as uh, Dr. San said, there was a very high suspicious endocarditis. We did not find anything in the transthoracic them. We went on and did a TE. So when, you, the, 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 when we did a TE, and the first thing is looking at that uh, uh, aortic valve, which uh, look thickened uh, and dysplastic, but not clearly, uh, there's not clear uh, a mass or, or vegetation the, that uh, or, or mobile mass that you can think that is a vegetation. The thickening of the cast is no different than had been before. We did not have a TE before, but very similar to the transthoracics that the patient had before. So we, we went on and uh, I assessed the rest of the heart and, and, and we couldn't find anything. And as part of, of the protocol of coming out, uh, we, we came out looking at the aorta and because he had an stent, we just wanted to make sure that the, the, uh, in the, the stent was okay and there was no problem there. And to our surprise, when we were coming out, we saw this mobile 
a tiny mobile uh, echogenic structures within the stent. You have seen here, you see here the stent in, in short axis and on the, in the left imaging image, sorry, you can see the stent in long axis and you can see this is mobile structures inside the stent that you can see also here. We, the transthoracic had not shown any uh, any uh, obstruction of the of the uh, descending aorta. So we just look at that area in more detail and you can see clearly here that actually in the stent there are two masses um, uh, within the, the wall of the aorta and behind the aorta this is this collection here with echogenic uh, um, uh, pockets of, of air suggesting uh, uh, um, abscess uh, in the mediastinum behind the aorta. So, so we diagnose him with an infection in uh, with endocarditis of the stent of the coarctation, and uh, he went on and had surgery. The surgery confirmed actually that the valve was not infected, and there was a, an abscess behind the stent, and there were two vegetations within the stent, and this was the the first uh, and. I'm not sure it's going to be the last, but it was the first time I ever seen an uh, infection in a coarctation stent. And if anything I learned with this case is that you have to be very thorough in your assessment and not to miss any part and being very systematic, not to miss anything and not assume that because you haven't seen something is not going to happen. And with that, I guess uh, to finalize with uh, some take home, take home messages. So. Patients with congenital heart disease have a higher risk of developing endocarditis than the general population. In our patients, the right-sided endocarditis is more prevalent, uh, prevalent sorry, and uh, uh, if you have a patient with uh, tetragiophallot that have either a bioprosthetic valve or RV2PA conduit, they, that, uh, these patients are at higher risk of developing endocarditis. And when you assess this RV2PA conduit, so this bioprostective primary, primary valve or the percutaneous primary valve, please go and uh, uh, to your high esophageal view, look at your bifurcation and uh, uh, just to have a good view of the, of the valve and also to have a good assessment of the conduit, uh, of, the, of the gradient, sorry. Don't forget that if you have a percutaneous pulmonary valve, you are more likely to have the vegetations on the back of the stent or within the stent rather than in the cusp of the valve. And if you have severe pulmonary stenosis, do not, to for, do not forget to assess your right ventricular function because the surgeon is going to need that information in order to decide how urgent is to refer this patient or to operate this patient. If you have a... a infection on a VSD or, a, or either a native or a, a, a VSD patch, just uh, do multiple views to look at your patch and also always look at your pulmonary artery and um, and don't forget that, you know, unusual locations might occur and don't assume that because you haven't seen it, it's not going to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Alonso. Um, we're going to um, move to some questions um, from the audience. Um, a couple of them have been addressed in the chat uh, by some of the speakers, but perhaps we'll come to them just so the rest of the group can hear as well. Um, so uh, one question uh, we had uh, from uh, Dr. Galahado and uh, also Dr. Minkovic. Um, uh, Dr. Minkovic says, uh, th th these questions for about endocarditis. Um, so uh, what are the T-based uh, indications to expose an aortic valve whenever mobile mass or masses are found um, incidentally attached to the aortic valve leaflets? And and then Dr. Gallardo sort of complemented that by saying, well, um, when should we intervene in the aortic valve when we have an OR echo finding of an undiagnosed mass? attached to the aortic cusp in a patient scheduled, uh, in this case, for a cabbage, with the consent being for a cabbage? So uh, I'm going to address the um, the one about uh, if you find a mass on an echo, when do you do the TE? In terms of in the OR, I might defer that to um, to RJ since he's on mm -hmm. the on camera right now. Um, but for... For so, if you see something on, a, I'm I'm an imaging person. I'm very low threshold to to do a TEE. So let me put that out there. Now that being said, I've never had to do a TEE myself, so I might change my mind if I ever have to do one. 
So if you have a mask and you don't know what it is, tea is always helpful because it gives you a better look. It lets you see if there's anything else smaller that you don't pick up on your transthoracic imaging. And it also looks at the other valves. But in terms of figuring what it is, it all depends on the clinical uh, scenarios around it. So you would have to do a broad base workup looking for connective tissue diseases. Um, if you see multivalve lesions, you're always looking for something systemic, right? So you would want to do blood work and the usual investigations and take a good history of the patient. Where are they coming from? Where were they? Uh, what's in their background and so forth? And so I think it's um, it's both a um, um, both a sort of a clinical scenario as well as then figuring out is there other things or is this just an isolation? Thank you. Um, so uh, to you, RJ, um, here we are in the OR, we're doing a cabbage, um, we're doing an echo for some reason, and uh, we find this mass. Um, but with, with that, we haven't done a workup for connective tissue disorders. Uh, we uh, don't necessarily know that we have fevers or anything like that. Are we going to open up or, or when should we? Yeah, it's the same as if you find unrecognized mitral valve disease or an atrial septal defect or some other lesion in the heart. I think if you find something, you're going to have to deal with it because you're going to be back there in a little anyway. You know, it always depends. Obviously, it depends what it is. If it's a, if it's a mass and it's fixed mass and it's not a typical anatomic structure, then you might leave it alone. But the bottom line is, as I told you, any imaging in the world, every imaging in the world does not tell you what it actually is. And if it's something that's flopping and wiggling around, you're going to remove it because there's a metabolic risk. If it's something big, you're going to remove it or at least see whether you can remove it or at least call somebody. And, you know, call somebody in your unit, especially if it's a tumor and it's something that's so bizarre you've never seen it before, doesn't mean you have to wait in your own unit. You can call somebody in another hospital like us. I'm always available in, through Toronto General Hospital and you can call us. Like anybody here on the panel, you can call anybody to find out what it is. But a TE echo is there to look at the pathology you're interested in, but you're not going to avoid other pathologies if you find them. You know, so yes, you should you should explore it at all times. If it's something that's uh, real and obvious, you should explore it, even if to figure out what it is or biopsy it or take a culture of it or remove it or whatever. It is. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's important. Um, Matthias Reis asks, um, this is about masses, um, uh, are there any, uh, this is quite a broad question, are there any preoperative findings on any imaging modality, um, I guess the major ones they're interested in, uh, that might predict inoperability or um, somebody who's too high risk to actually go ahead for resection? Yeah, I mean, what we're looking for is uh, multiple locations. Um, if it's uh, one location and 15 other locations, very, very, very rarely we go after the cardiac one, like the one that Annette showed where the guy was going to die from obstruction. And there was, we knew a lot about this individual. But in general, if you find it in multiple places, I was asked to see somebody who has a, a tumor in one place and has brain meds. So you're not going to operate in the heart there. Um, but also transgression through multiple sites that you know you can't remove. And so that's a... a Lesions usually at the base of the interventricular septum that involve interventricular septum, aortic root, pulmonary valve, you know, the, the central fibrous body tumors like that that are very, very difficult to remove, despite the principles that I said. Mm -hmm. um, so we look for all that stuff before we do the echo, but the preoperative echo helps us to determine that as well. So you saw some very, very large tumors. And if it didn't, if it looked as though there was no sliding between the walls that was stuck to adjacent structures, you have to look at that sort of thing and see what the individual you're dealing with. If the person is 25 years old, and unfortunately it happens to those people, it's one thing, but if they're 80 years old, you're gonna have a different approach to it. So it all depends on the individual that you're dealing with and what it is you find, and especially if you find metastatic disease. And that's what, those are the major, in the short answer, those are the major things we look for. So that's what we look for before we go to the bar. But echo is part of that. And sometimes you think it's unresectable. When you do the echo, you see that sliding motion and you know it's in, confined to one spot, then you'll go ahead and do it. So mm -hmm. echo is extremely important in that workup. And stuff that MRI won't tell you, even though the CINI MRI gives you an idea not as good as echo. Okay. Um, and I think you guys have addressed this, but I'll, I'll read it for the group. Um, so um, Matthew uh, Griffey uh, says, we had a strange myxoma attached to the intraatrial septum causing elongation of the anterior mitral valve leaflet. It was removed uh, with part of the intraatrial septum, 
a mitral valve replacement was necessary, but then there was bleeding from the aortomitral curtain with high velocity flow from the aortomitral continuity into the left atrium. Have you ever seen a myxoma which recruited a blood supply from the left atrium? Yeah, I didn't quite understand what they did here, whether it was attached to the atrial septum and the anterior leaflet. Like, there's no reason why a tumor should cause elongation of the mitral leaflet. And I was highly suspicious uh, in this one. I asked whether they truly had pathology, whether this was a sarcoma of some sort, uh, uh, affecting both the atrium and the, and the uh, valve. And the other thing I was wondering whether the blow that they saw was really a paravalvular leak or a perforation of the anterior leaflet base. So, uh, you know, blood vessels shouldn't be causing a high flow of velocity. And I mentioned uh, with respect to that for the people who haven't read it, is that we've seen uh, tumors coming from every wall of the left atrium, right atrium, right, atrium uh, right ventricle and left ventricle. So we've seen it coming from everywhere. And uh, even with malignant disease or other disease where you see on, on coronary angiography a feeder vessel, you rarely see that feeder vessel at the time of the operation. So I don't know what this was, but I can't believe it was a feeding vessel. You'll see occasionally um, blood vessels bleeding into the ventricle when you do um, a ROS procedure. You know, you see some of the septals bleeding into the into the ventricle. But this is just something unusual, and I can't believe that this one is a vessel. To me, it sounds more like a perforation of the anterior leaflet or something, a repair valve, but you can change the valve. Any other people comment about that one? Okay. Um, for uh, Dr. Tang, uh, again, um, th this is a question about, um, you, you mentioned the new guidelines introducing PET and CT. Um, they mentioned that they recently, uh, this is uh, Jacobo Carrillo, uh, we recently encountered a clinical case involving C1, C2 osteomyelitis, osteomyelitis with a susceptible organism, MSSA, unknown uh, source with diagnostic TTE. TE was suggested, but because there was cervical spine in, um, injury, they didn't want to do it. Um, and I guess the question then is, uh, what, what out of those other imaging modalities, what is um, the best option, and uh, what are you losing uh, or gaining if you do a CT? It's, it's pretty straightforward to put someone through a, a CT, uh, relatively, isn't it, um, compared to the other two sometimes? Yeah. So I think I think when you have someone who has a known infection somewhere else, then making the diagnosis of infective endocarditis is for duration of therapy and then looking for complications. It depends on how non-diagnostic your, your transthoracic echocardiogram is. That's the first thing, whether or not there are other views that could be considered that, that we don't usually think of using. Because sometimes... Um, in the, and also because we do a lot of congenital patients, the trans, uh, the the subcostal or transgastric views that we can do from surface studies are actually very helpful for identifying things. Now that being said, if you can't do a trans, uh, if the transthoracic is actually like not diagnostic, and you can't do a transesophageal echocardiogram, then PET could be helpful here. Now PET for native valves is not as good as it is in prostatic um, prostatic uh, materials or identifying lesions in that. The other consideration is depending on how badly you want to make a diagnosis to consider intracardiac. Oh, yeah. Now that becomes invasive and the, um, then you have to buy in from your interventional cardiologist to do this. And then does it change your management? Does it change how long you're going to treat them for? And then are there other signs that that would make you think that they have a complication that you have to chase this because it becomes a risk benefit. How invasive are you going to go for how much benefit are you going to get? And so that's what it comes down to. But those would be the other imaging modalities I would, I would consider. And another question for uh, you, Dr. Sang. Oh, sorry, Audrey. You know, if you can't see it on trans thoracic echo, um, you know, there are other modalities you can use. But frankly, if you're dealing with somebody with a C-spine osteomyelitis, uh, you're not going to operate in their heart anyway. And um, the duration of treatment for osteomyelitis is, is, I think, the same as for cardiac infection anyway. So you really, again, have to look at the patient that you're going to deal with, and, mm. you know, in terms of what you're going to do next. Sure. But there um, are other values. Fantastic. Um, and then um, uh, uh, Kiriband uh, Sanapan um, asks uh, Dr. Sang, is it possible to uh, differentiate a healed vegetation from an active one? On, well, I think he's mentioned he's he's talking about echo, right? And and I think um, 
I think it, it dep- you have to see where the patient is in the clinical course. You have to take into account what they are. If they have signs that they're actively, they've still got fevers, they've still got bacteremia, then likely you have something that's active. But if you have someone who's been treated, who is not febrile anymore, and it's been, you're talking weeks, months down the line, then it's likely a um, a, a healed vegetation at that point. And serial Im- this is where serial imaging helps, as well as understanding the clinical course of the patient. Thank you. Um, just last question for Dr. Alonso. Um you were um, well. You you were talking about VST patches, um, and we looked at interrogating them across a range of two D planes. Um, is there um, do do you find any benefit to looking at the uh, intraventricular septum in three D in these situations? Is there any benefit to that? In in terms of the of the VST patch assessment for infection point of view, normally not because mm-hmm. actually what well, our surgeons find is actually more often than not there there's some degree of uh, inflammation on the patch, so mm-hmm. what they want to look at is uh, whether the patch is the his or not, whether there's a mass attached in there or there is a a a, 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 a VSD. More than that, we cannot really say, and for both of them. 2D probably is much better. Normally, the vegetation on the on a non the his patch is so tiny that actually with the 3D you can you can uh, 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 lose frame rate and you might actually not see it. So if uh, the vegetations in, are only large, if you have a the his patch, then then you see both the ve- the residual VSD and the vegetation in 2D becomes more uh, helpful than 3D. Okay. And one final quick thing uh, to you as well. Um, the uh, primary uh, repair for the uh, discharge of fallow, the shunt um, from the RV to the uh, RPA, right pulmonary artery, the, um, if, if that's been ligated for a secondary repair and it's still in, uh, it's still tissue in place that might be at risk of endocarditis, uh, is that um, something we can we, we should try and visualize in these patients? No, we don't really see them. So the VT shunt is, uh, I guess you mean you, you mean the VT shunt that is placed before mm-hmm. the repair, right? So the, the VT shunt is a cortex tube that they place between the your subclavian and your pulmonary artery that the seniors ligate at the time of uh, of the of the complete repair, and that becomes thrombotic thrombosis and there is no flow, and then I never ever seen a infected VT shunt because actually there is no flow in it. So. So it becomes a, a, a solid rock uh, calcified structure and uh, and there is no possibility of endocarditis. But as I said at the end, you know, you will always can see something for the first time in your life. I have never ever came across to a vitician infected. Sometimes these viticians have residual flow and, and you know, maybe one day I will come with a, a close one, but many of them or, or most of them are from both. A conduit that are and very uh, very unlikely to become infected. Thank you very much, um, and um, I think that wraps up our session. Thank you very much to all of our speakers um, for coming and giving excellent talks today. Thank you very much for having us. Mm-hmm. Pig award. Oh, pig award. All right, Annette. Thanks yes. Very much thanks for so much. Me to do this. Yes. Thanks so much for coming. It's yes. been... Okay. So. Uh, just before we uh, break for lunch, just want to take a couple of seconds here to uh, have our annual Tag Award ceremony. So each year, the Symposium Planning Committee recognizes an outstanding clinician for their remarkable contributions to the field. The recipients of the annual Perioperative Echo Group Award exemplify excellence in both clinical practice and academic echocardiography, demonstrating a deep commitment to advancing knowledge through their work on guidelines and peer-reviewed publications. It is with great pride that we present the 2024 PEG Award to Dr. Wendy Tsang. During her introduction, Dr. Shrifi already emphasized Dr. Tsang's impressive education and accomplishments. She is widely regarded as a leading expert in echocardiography, having significantly influenced the field through her contributions to several paramount guidelines. Currently, Dr. Tsang holds the position of cardiologist and clinician investigator at the Toronto General Hospital, where she heads the Complex Valve Clinic. Additionally, she serves as Assistant Professor of Medicine at the University of Toronto. What truly distinguishes Dr. Zhang is her unwavering dedication to research. Her primary interests encompass 3D echocardiography, artificial intelligence, valvular heart disease, and adult congenital heart disease, fields in which she has published extensively. Dr. Zhang's commitment to research has garnered her recognition on both national and international stages. Despite her numerous accolades, she remains approachable and humble, always willing to educate, answer questions, and actively engage in collaborative work. In relation to the symposium, 
Dr. Zhang has been one of the staunchest supporters of the Toronto Perioperative Echo meeting since her early days at TGH. The breadth of her expertise is evident in the lectures she has delivered at the symposium, where she has been a featured speaker annually since 2019. Her past presentations include percutaneous tricuspid valve interventions, AI and machine learning, common errors and challenges of pitfalls, tricuspid regurgitation, and TEE to guide treatment of paravalvular leaks. We are truly delighted to have her as part of our team at TGH, particularly as a cornerstone of our annual ECHO Symposium. Congratulations once again to Dr. Wendy Tsang. Uh, thank you um, to Mazin and Marcus for this, uh, and the committee for this award. I, I really am very touched by it. Uh, the cardiac anesthesia group has been sort of my second academic home here. Uh, you, the passion you guys have for echo and imaging is unsurpassed in this institution. And um, as collaborators, you've been very welcoming and I've created, I guess, uh, wonderful connections and, and some of the friendships here have been really deeply meaningful to me. And so I wanna thank you for this award and I am very touched again by this, thanks. Thank you. And with that, we will uh, take a health break and break for lunch and uh, reconvene in about 45 minutes. <laughs>